James Madison, like Washington and Jefferson before him, and President Monroe, who followed, came from Virginia. It was a state that produced remarkable leaders. The son of one of Virginia's oldest families, Madison grew up here at Montpelier and was educated at plantation schools. His family valued education. At the age of 18, he went to college at what is today Princeton University, where he studied Hebrew and ethics. Madison developed into a scholar and an intellectual. It was a time of revolution, and Madison began to focus on the question of how America ought to be governed. Director of Education at Montpelier, Melanie Bierman. When you look back in history for examples of what worked, he, he looked to ancient Greece for, to see what worked and put together what's become known to history as the Virginia Plan, which was essentially an outline for the structure of American government. He took this plan to the Philadelphia Convention and large chunks of that were adopted into the Constitution. For example, the idea of three branches of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judicial branch. The year was 1787, summertime. Despite his youth, Madison was able to put together a practical plan and he later would become known as the father of the Constitution. He wanted a strong government, strong enough to force states to pay taxes, and strong enough to earn respect to foreign nations, but balanced enough so no one interest could dominate. He understood the art of compromise, he understood the art of negotiation, he understood that human beings are motivated by self-interest. And when one understands that about human beings, then that's what politics is all about. In the following year, the Constitution was ratified and the United States had a new government. But there was widespread feeling that the Constitution alone wasn't enough. There were heated arguments about protecting the individual and Madison took the lead to write the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments to the Constitution. In 1801, President Jefferson appointed Madison as Secretary of State. Madison was viewed as a strong man, as someone who stood up to Britain and France. President Jefferson thus looked to Madison to succeed him and endorsed his Secretary of State in 1808. It was a gesture which helped secure Madison's election. The year was 1809, and James Madison took the oath of office to become the fourth president of the United States. Madison's wife, Dolly, was to become a first lady of style and grace, known for her lavish entertaining. By the time she becomes first lady in the White House in the early 1800s, she is uh, transformed into uh, a rather um, the fashion plate of her day, the Jackie Kennedy of her day. What Dolly wore was copied throughout Washington. At the beginning of his term, the continued harassment of American trading ships was rapidly evolving into the major issue of the day. Britain and France refused to respect neutrality of the American fleet. In 1811, France yielded to pressure and released all captured American ships. The following year, war was declared against Britain, the War of 1812. America was unprepared to fight. The British penetrated American defenses in Maryland and marched into Washington. The president's wife, Dolly, refused to leave the White House without having arranged for the safety of national treasures inside. She filled a wagon and fled to Virginia. British troops burned Washington. Three days later, the British retreated, and when the Madisons returned to the White House, they found an empty shell. The president and his wife moved to Octagon House in Washington, while the White House was rebuilt. The war effort began improving. The British were first turned back in Upper New York and then at Baltimore. 
It was September 14th. A young man named Francis Scott Key looked across Baltimore Harbor at the British cannons firing on Fort McHenry. All through the night, the bombardment continued. And the next morning, the American flag was still flying. Key was inspired and so relieved and so proud that he wrote the words to the Star Spangled Banner, our national anthem. Eventually, both war-weary sides negotiated the Treaty of Ghent in 1814, ending the war the following year. In some eyes, the War of 1812 was the second American Revolution. So the fact that even though the war was sort of a stalemate, um, the, the fact that the British had not reestablished themselves in America was important. The war had ended American economic dependence on Britain. The nation could focus now on growth. In the Pacific Northwest, the first permanent settlement was started by John Jacob Astor's fur business. And the first steamboat was traveling the great Mississippi River. It was a time of peace and prosperity. By the end of Madison's second term, he was a popular figure. He retired from public life. The year was 1817. Like Jefferson, slavery was a paradox for Madison and a personal burden. Madison owned a plantation requiring intense manual labor. And that labor was provided by slaves. But in principle, he was against slavery. And like Jefferson, after a long life of accomplishments, Madison looked to the future and saw a nation in trouble. And I've often wondered, is long life a gift from the gods or is it in fact a burden? For in his case, he saw the work of his youth begin to become undone. And in fact, the last public piece he wrote was uh, something called Advice to My Country, where he pleaded that the Union should stay intact. But there were also family problems. His son was a gambler and an alcoholic. Paying off more than $40,000 of his son's gambling losses, the retired president, the father of the Constitution, and author of the Bill of Rights, would end up a man in debt. He died in 1836, at 85 the last of the Founding Fathers. Democratic Republican, 1809 to 1817, age 57, from Virginia. He was eminently qualified for the job. A veteran of the Revolution, author of the Constitution, a Jeffersonian Democrat, and a Virginian. There are people who feel that he had a much in some ways a better mind than Jefferson, certainly a more disciplined mind than Jefferson. In truth, James Madison was everything Thomas Jefferson wasn't. He was sort of the opposite of Jefferson physically. He was short while Jefferson was tall. He was funnier than Jefferson. He was known as having a body sense of humor. He had light hair, turned gray, blue eyes, was soft-spoken, and not given to rage or small talk usually dressed in black. Madison brought something else to the White House that had been missing during Jefferson's presidency, a first lady. Dolly Madison is enormously important in the shaping of protocol. She is a younger, vivacious woman who sparkles, sort of brightens up what is considered Madison's drab exterior. He becomes a much more interesting, exciting figure because of her. The Madisons became known for lavish parties and sumptuous feasts at the White House. These often included ice cream, a delicacy of the day. Dolly's favorite flavor was oyster. As an executive, Madison had an abiding sense of fairness, a calm demeanor, and was always well prepared. This was not only a very smart man, this was a man who did his homework, who did his thinking, who did his studying and was really prepared for whatever came up. Except for a war, the War of 1812, which ultimately defined his presidency. 
Madison comes into office with an enormous problem on his hands. Half the country's still pushing to go to war with England, half the country's pushing to go to war with France. And Madison is really pushed by events into the war with England. The War of 1812 was sparked on the high seas. Shortly after Madison's inauguration, the British began seizing American ships and impressing U.S. sailors and merchant seamen. Diplomatic efforts to solve the crisis went nowhere. Finally, on June 18, 1812, James Madison became the first president in U.S. history to ask Congress for a declaration of war. Imagine what Hutzburg it took. We declared war on Great Britain. They did not declare war on us. Our Navy in 1812 numbered about 20 ships. Theirs numbered about 1,000. Their army was battling Napoleon and was triumphant. We had barely a militia. It was a foolish thing to do. It is a disaster. We lose uh, humiliating engagements in Detroit and in upstate New York, and the war begins very badly indeed. Madison's troubles grew as the war progressed, especially in New England. There was almost a civil war in 1814 because New England threatens to secede. I mean, New England is so angry, their lifeblood is commerce and shipping. Then in August 1814, the British raided Washington and burned the president's mansion. Driven from his home, James Madison became the first and only sitting president to face enemy fire. He personally took command of a militia battery outside Washington, but to his embarrassment, the commander in chief was forced to retreat. Much as we hate to disappoint the American public who believes America has never lost a war, we definitely lost this war. Our capital was burned, we're defeated on land, on sea. And poor Madison is burdened with this image that he got us into the war. Desperate to end it, Madison sent James Monroe to negotiate peace with England. In December 1814, Monroe succeeded with the Treaty of Ghent, officially ending the war. Then, before news of the treaty reached Washington, America was strangely rewarded with a belated victory at the Battle of New Orleans. The man who benefited most was the defender of New Orleans, General Andrew Jackson. But the victory did little for James Madison. Two important things come out of this war. Dolly Madison saves the portrait of George Washington and the Star Spangled Banner but it does tarnish Madison. It's about the only thing he's really remembered for. The War of 1812 brought the American presidency into the politics of international diplomacy and the real world. Foreign issues could no longer be ignored. This is a rude awakening about world politics that Madison gets with the War of 1812. It's a time of the opening up of the presidency, the part of the American becoming much more mature, and the president has to play a role in this because he is the symbol of the United States. As with those who came before him and those who would follow, James Madison learned a harsh lesson about the office he helped create. It is not so much about the man, but the unforeseen events which define a presidency. Before the War of 1812, James Madison proposed that the United States, instead of building new ships, should simply rent Portugal's navy. It didn't happen.